So that's just a few of uh, programs coming up. So today we are really pleased to have Dr. William Schlesinger with us, He's President Emeritus at the Cary Institute, which I know all of you are familiar with. And uh, previously he was on the faculty of Duke for 27 years, and actually he is coming to us today from North Carolina. Uh, he's author and co-author of several hundred scientific papers on the subject of environmental chemistry, uh, has published numerous editorials and columns in various media, out media outlets, including Chicago Tribune, Los Angeles Times, New York Times, on and on. Uh, his latest book, Translational Ecology, was published in September 2017, which was an anthology of some of these popular writings. He was among the first to quantify the amount of carbon held in soil organic matter globally, providing subsequent estimates of the role of soils and human impacts on forests and climate change. Uh, as a member of the National Academy of Sciences, he was president of the Ecological Society of America for a year or so, uh, currently serves on the Board of Trustees for Natural Resources, Defense Council, and Southern Environmental Law Center. So uh, he's quite versed in science and all these matters, and we really appreciate him spending a little time with us today. So uh, welcome, Dr. Schlesinger. Oh, good to be here. Thank you for that introduction. As Lawrence said, I hung out uh, as uh, president of the Cary Institute for seven years in, in Millbrook. Uh, and upon retirement, uh, Lisa and I built a, as it were, greenhouse in Lubeck, Maine, where we spend about seven or eight months of the year. Uh, and then in the winter, we're, we're, uh, we chicken out and come down to North Carolina, where pre-pandemic, we enjoyed seeing old friends during the winter. Uh, and uh, such. Uh, this year we've been a little bit hunkered down and uh, unable to do that, but uh, I keep uh, my finger in the pot of uh, various things in environmental chemistry, which I call biogeochemistry, uh, and uh, try to keep writing and uh, working on these kinds of things. Now Lawrence asked me to uh, talk today about climate change and in particular uh, to focus on some things in New England. I think he uh, felt that there'd been enough talk about the global aspect of this, uh, and I hope uh, I will be able to do or fulfill that particular role today. I do want to start with three or four uh, screens here that uh, put us all on the same wavelength of why uh, climate change occurs uh, globally, it acts out locally, uh, and uh, then we'll focus in on New England. So, so first I got to figure out how to, okay, that worked. Um, all of this revolves around carbon dioxide. I think if you look at your uh, newspaper, or listen to the television, there's no question that you hear a lot about carbon dioxide. Uh, and we have good records of carbon dioxide in the past because it's captured in the bubbles of air that are in the Greenland and Antarctic ice packs. And what you have to do, this is uh, painstaking work, but all you have to do is take a core uh, down through those layers of ice, uh, bring it back to the lab in what usually is a long tube frozen, uh, cut it into sections, melt the sections in an evacuated container, and the air at the various levels uh, is released and can be analyzed for carbon dioxide concentration. And this graph basically shows what's happened over the last thousand years. So today is over here on the right hand side, a uh, thousand years ago over here on the left hand side. This is carbon dioxide in parts per million in the atmosphere. And basically for the longest period of time, it bounced around between about 270 at the lowest or 275 parts per million and about 285. But starting at with the Industrial Revolution in the mid 1800s, uh, it began to advance quite uh, rapidly to levels uh, that had hitherto not been seen uh, in uh, the atmosphere. And today, as we speak, and uh, it doesn't matter where you are logging in in the Zoom call, uh, the carbon dioxide, if you were to step outside, is about 410 parts per million in the atmosphere. So it's continued to skyrocket off the top of this. Uh, graph. Now, why do we care about that? Well, it's been, uh, the, this is the greenhouse analogy, and some of you may be familiar with that, but it's been known for a long time 
that if you put up a greenhouse or you park your car in a sunny parking lot, that uh, in a summer day, the sun's radiation will pass through the glass of a greenhouse or your car and be absorbed by the surfaces inside. And that heat radiation that's then given off by those warm surfaces uh, is very slow and uh, impeded in, its, in passing through the glass. And so the inside of the uh, house gets warm uh, and uh, relatively limited amounts of heat radiation are transmitted uh, uh, outside uh, to the atmosphere. Now, carbon dioxide, CO2, and water vapor, H2O, in Earth's atmosphere act in a very analogous fashion to the glass of a greenhouse. They allow the sun's radiation to pass through the atmosphere and be absorbed by the ground or the surface of the seas. Uh, those warm surfaces give off heat radiation, but carbon dioxide, water vapor, and a few other gases trap that outgoing radiation and cause the atmosphere to warm. And so that's the analogy to the greenhouse, and we hear about the greenhouse effect uh, all the time in the newspaper. Now, is this uh, something that we can see playing out in today's world? Uh, and in the last uh, thousand years, this is a, a graph of the temperatures seen on planet Earth, reconstructed from various uh, 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 forms of data, thermometers as back as thermometers go, from tree rings, from uh, isotopic records. Uh, and you can put together a record of what the temperature has been and see that up until about 1880, 1850 or so, uh, that uh, the temperature of the planet was fairly constant uh, over the long period. It bounced around year to year for sure. Uh, and then about the same time the carbon dioxide began to increase in Earth's atmosphere, uh, the temperature of the Earth began to warm uh, quite rapidly. Now, interestingly, the red line that's plotted on top of the overlying trend here is the record that's been recorded in the era of good weather stations with good thermometers. And it matches quite closely to these reconstructions based on tree rings, uh, corals, and isotopic records. And the overlap there, uh, the correlation, the good correlation between what we know from uh, organized uh, weather reporting and past records uh, from what we call proxies, the fact that those overlap and correlate well gives us some faith in the, uh, the historical record here. Now, one more thing to put us on the same wavelength. Many of people will say, well, gee, hasn't carbon dioxide gone up and down a lot in the past, uh, and therefore haven't temperatures changed uh, uh, up and down in the past? And the answer is yes. If you look back through Earth's history, you can find times when the carbon dioxide concentration was uh, as much as a thousand times <clears throat> more concentrated than it is today. But importantly, if you look back in ice cores that go back to 10 or 12,000 years ago, over that period of time, carbon dioxide has been fairly level in Earth's atmosphere, again, between about 260 and 290 parts per million. And it wasn't until recently that we saw this pop up to today's level, uh, up near 400 or 410. <coughs> the important thing about that trend uh, the well, the absence of a trend, the fair constancy of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere, is this uh, time period represents the entire time of civilized human society. By that I mean agriculture, language, money, people living in cities with trade. Uh, we've had a fairly benign and constant uh, period of temperature on the Earth's surface, uh, correlated with carbon dioxide concentration, which was fairly constant. And now it seems that we've perturbed this quite strongly. So yes, it has changed dramatically in the past, the distant past, uh, probably will change dramatically in the distant future. But at least for the period of uh, human existence that we have a record of, and the planning for our existence in the next hundreds to thousands of years, uh, the climate up to recently, uh, we could anticipate and it has been fairly constant. Now I want to talk about why we would be concerned about the effect of rising carbon dioxide on temperature. And I'm gonna give a bunch of examples. Many of these are related to New England or the Northeastern US. 
some of them I'm going to give you a more global map and ask you to look at New England and the eastern U.S. Uh, but uh, they're all to reinforce the fact uh, that over the past couple of decades, uh, in fact, with the rise of CO2, carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere, we've seen a rise in the temperature of the planet uh, in uh, many places. This is a view of Here's North America, South America, Africa, Asia, Australia, uh, from space, from a satellite that goes round and round uh, the Earth. It's up there going round and round uh, the Earth right now. And it looks down and measures the temperature on the surface uh, below it. And you can compare the trends that have been recorded uh, in that period. Here's a 20 year period, 1979 to 1998, which I picked because uh, the warm, it implies that the warming has been around uh, as a phenomena associated with carbon dioxide for, it didn't just happen yesterday, it happened as much as 20 years ago. And here's a, a temperature scale that shows the change in Earth's temperature from no change plotted in white to places that got cooler plotted in blue, places that got warmer plotted in increasing orangish red in degrees centigrade. For working purposes today, uh, you can multiply those by two and get Fahrenheit. And you'll notice that most of the places that have gotten really warm are at the high northern latitudes up here in Canada and Alaska, Greenland, Scandinavia, Siberia. Around the equator and uh, mid latitudes, uh, there's been relatively little change. And then there's another band of warming in the southern hemisphere, but for various technical reasons, it doesn't extend all the way down into uh, Antarctica. It may in the future, uh, but it's uh, showing up first at kind of the mid latitudes of the southern hemisphere. And some of these areas are now two, two, three degrees Fahrenheit warmer uh, than they were just a few uh, decades ago. The projection for the future, and here I'm asking you to compare change in temperature between 2020, 2030, the decade we've just uh, entered, uh, versus uh, the decade 1990 to 2000. This is a computer model that predicts where temperature uh, will rise, where it won't, uh, for a decadal period. And the decade in question is the one we're currently living in. And again, uh, here's the scale at the bottom in centigrade, two degrees <clears throat> centigrade over here in the dark brown is about four degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and you'll see uh, that the warming trend at these high northern latitudes, uh, North America, uh, Greenland, Scandinavia, Siberia, uh, continues quite strongly. It comes on strongly now in Antarctica. Again, relatively little change along the equator. And if you look at New England and uh, the northeastern U.S., the temperature change projected is about one degrees uh, centigrade uh, compared to the last uh, decade or two degrees Fahrenheit. Before I move on to the next slide, I wanna point out the fact that the temperature change is not uniform globally. Uh, it underlies part of the problem when trying to negotiate global policies uh, on this particular issue. Well, what's it mean for a one or two degrees Fahrenheit uh, rise in New England? Uh, I live in Maine now, and so I happen to have data from the state of Maine uh, that projects here uh, two scenarios. One, if we par uh, continue to live in a period of higher emissions, and another uh, projected for a period if, if we do something about our emissions uh, for various 20-year uh, periods. Uh, here's 2010 to 2040, roughly, 30-year period there, 2040 to 2070, 2070 to, uh, to uh, the year 2100. So here's Maine today. And this is as if Maine were marching southward with the most extreme example, the high emission scenario for late in this century has the climate in Maine resembling something that you would find uh, in the state of Virginia today. Uh, so a wholesale change in the kind of summer and winter temperatures uh, compared to what we experience today. Presumably Connecticut, I looked, looked widely for a a similar graph of this for Connecticut and couldn't find one, but Maine is close. Uh, but presumably Connecticut would also be marching southward and probably resemble something like we see in North Carolina. Snow very infrequent, hot, humid days in the summer, 
uh, the norm uh, in those future scenarios. So these are very large uh, reorganizations of the temperature regime of uh, Eastern North America. Now it plays out in a number of ways. And I want to first talk about sea level rise because the warming at the high Northern latitudes affects places where right now there's a fair accumulation of ice on places like Greenland and uh, a lot of land area in Canada and Siberia. And this is a reconstruction based on satellite views of Greenland of the extent of the summertime melt in 1992, so some years ago, compared to 2005. And you can see that the summertime melt <coughs> in 1992 uh, extended to right about where I have my pointer today. And the summertime melt in 2005 was significantly more severe uh, and uh, was quite a bit upslope from that. And then of course, there's an ice pack in the summer uh, in the center of Greenland uh, at, at all seasons. Uh, but this is, seems to be a progressive melting of the Greenland ice pack. It's, of course, it snows there again in the winter. But every time we melt back uh, long-term accumulated ice, followed by a small amount of snow in the following summer, uh, the total amount of water held in the Greenland ice pack uh, decreases. And where does it go? Runs into the oceans. And what does that do? Well, we have good records of the height of tides worldwide as a result of a tradition of harbor masters around the world of measuring the height of the tide in their harbors. Uh, this used to be done simply with uh, yardsticks out at the end of the pier. Now it's done in a more sophisticated fashion by satellite. Uh, but you can see change in mean sea level in millimeters from 1880 uh, to the year 2000 here. Uh, and overall, there's a nice straight line. Sea level's been rising at about 1.8 millimeters uh, per year, if you plot that as a straight line. And you may say, well, sea level's always been rising. It was rising back there in the late 1800s before we cared about human-induced climate change. Uh, why should we be concerned about it now? Uh, and then I'd ask you to look a little bit more carefully at this graph. In the early period, it was rising at about 0.8 millimeters per year. In the middle part of this period, it started to increase and rise at about two millimeters per year. And now globally, it's rising between 3.2 and 3.5 millimeters per year, uh, you know, worldwide. Uh, and that will Im impact uh, the coast of Connecticut, the coast of Cape Cod and Maine uh, and New York City. Uh, you can you know, kind of extrapolate those out uh, in 10 years, and it's 32 millimeters. It's almost a, a, uh, a little more than an inch deeper than it is now. And in 100 years, it'd be uh, several feet uh, deeper. And what this means is that many coastal areas will be subjected to flooding. And so what I said earlier, uh, climate change is, is seen globally. It's felt locally. Uh, plays out with something like sea level rise. This is an extrapolation, a picture of the New York City area. Uh, extends over into, uh, I guess this doesn't extend over into Connecticut uh, quite uh, far enough, uh, but it shows areas in black that would be flooded every year with a sea level rise that's project projected for late uh, in this century. And you'll notice that includes almost all of the area around Kennedy Airport, Newark Airport and the lowlands over here in New Jersey. Uh, it extends to the lower end of uh, Manhattan, including most of Wall Street and the like. Uh, and of course, some of that may be dammed up the way they do in the Netherlands, uh, but only at great, great expense. Uh, so I guess my point there is we can expect one of the biggest effects of the rise in temperature seen in the, the Northeastern US and worldwide will be a flooding of coastal areas. This is not a time to, to uh, buy uh, large chunks of coastal real estate and expect to be leaving it for your grandchildren uh, on, uh, on the beach. Uh, the, well, let's look at a few other uh, effects of uh, rising temperature. I'm gonna call these the end effects of, indirect effects of rising temperature on the planet. On the health of forests, 
upon which we all depend, the health of crops where our food supply comes from, and the health of people. And boy, right now we're all concerned with the health of people around the country and uh, globally. So the health of forests. There's been any number of studies that have tried to look at what forests will be like late in this century if they experience warmer, and warmer often means drier conditions uh, as the century uh, unfolds. The top picture here is a map. And I don't expect you to be able to identify all these little different colors there, but uh, the general pattern is the thing to look at. It's a general picture of the Eastern US, of course, here's Connecticut up here, uh, and the types of forests that occur there today. And the red is a beech sugar maple forest. We're all familiar with that in terms of, we call it the Northern hardwood forest. It's where maple sugar comes from. Uh, by the time we get up to Maine, it's kind of been replaced by uh, spruce fir. Uh, but a big swath of the Northern part of the US is uh, this beech maple forest. In the mid part of the country, uh, the forest is largely dominated by an oak hickory. These are mature forests. And down here in the southeast in the, the blue and yellow are various kinds of pine forests uh, that uh, are often also subjected to a regime of frequent uh, fire. Now these distributions of forest trees today have been studied for a long period of time. And for the most part, the boundaries between them are associated with well-known aspects of the climate, particularly the cold temperatures experienced during the winter. And as you project onto the eastern U.S., the kind of climate scenario that we expect for late in the century, the bottom picture here is what to expect the changes in forest composition to look like. And you'll notice that sugar maple and beech, the red here, is largely lost from all the area which we associated and it'll be found out here in Wisconsin and Minnesota. The southeastern U.S. largely loses its the blue and the yellow, the pine forests, uh, in favor of those occurring out here in East Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And most of the eastern U.S. forests at maturity would be projected to be some kind of oak hickory uh, forest. Now, the specifics of this could be argued. In fact, they are argued at acad in academic circles at great length. Uh, this is the kind of science where the people doing it are not gonna be around when their projections are evaluated. Um, and so it's a kind of a safe science to participate in. Uh, but the fact that the changes are so dramatic uh, should concern us all. When I lecture down here in the Southeast where the forest products industry is huge, I point out to the, the local audience that if you're a stockholder, an employee, or uh, otherwise interested in the forest products industry in the Southeast, maybe you shouldn't be replanting with various kinds of pine uh, because they're not gonna be the ones that do well as a mature species uh, in late part of this century. Up here in the Northeast, where uh, one might be particularly concerned, or at least I'm a particular, uh, I have a particular personal interest in maple syrup. I love this stuff. Um, that as a forest product, the projected maple syrup flow in liters per trap per tap per tree. Uh, if you compare 1950 to the year 1999, basically 2000, uh, and then late in the century, uh, that the liters per tap range between 80 and 100 over much of the area that was is currently mapped in red, that uh, Northern Hardwoods uh, beech maple forest, including uh, Connecticut. Late in this century, essentially, the maple sugar industry will have retreated from all of that area. Might be found a little bit up here in the top of the state of Maine. Uh, but uh, again, if you're talking about a change in economics associated with that industry, uh, the Canadians are going to benefit a lot. Uh, the employees and economics of maple, the maple sugar industry in eastern North America, northeastern North America, essentially will be lost. Now, so that's a few words on the health of forests. Uh, it's not that there won't be forests, 
but the forests are going to be very different in the kinds of products, kinds of livelihood derived from them, very different from today. And the fire frequency may, may be very different as a result of changes in uh, the rate of drying and high temperatures in the distribution of rainfall. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the distribution of crops. Uh, we may not all live in areas where widespread row crops are important economics, but every time you go to the grocery store, you see and feel the benefits or problems that are that play out in widespread uh, uh, economics of food growing areas, particularly in the central US. Now, I mentioned earlier that the lowest wintertime temperatures are often the uh, things that uh, really determine the uh, distribution of plants. And nowhere is that uh, more important than in the distribution of a number of the agricultural plants that we depend on. On the left here is the distribution of the corn earworm today, seen in the number of years from one over here to 24 in the dark brown, that a farmer can expect the corn earworm to infect his or her crops uh, in, in the southeast, uh, in the Midwest, and the Northeast. It's a species that does not survive cold winters very well. And so, uh, New York State and Connecticut and uh, the upper Midwest here are largely protect, protected uh, from infestations of the corn earworm affecting the national corn crop. The right hand side shows a distribution of this late in this century. Again, without uh, the cold winters that knocked back the corn earworm, uh, the distribution of corn earworm infected uh, areas uh, moves northward much of the Midwest where we currently have these bountiful uh, yields of corn harvest would now be subjected to corn earworm on a fairly regular basis. Uh, New England, where maybe the whole economy doesn't depend on the uh, growth of corn, uh, but you can see that corn earworm would be seen uh, there uh, much more frequently than it is today and inhibit the ability to grow corn in those areas. I could show this kind of graph for any number of pests and any number of crops. Uh, Dave Lobel out at Stanford is one of the best at this kind of thing. And it's something that should concern us all because agriculture, as I said, it plays out for the farmer in the local area, but it plays out for all of us in the local grocery store. I want to think a little bit about the health of people. Warmer temperatures often mean that uh, some of the nastier uh, particularly insect and arachnid uh, distributed uh, pests uh, will be seen in areas in which they currently don't occur very frequently. Uh, this is the tick that uh, is associated with Lyme disease. Now, of course, Connecticut is blessed with Lyme, Connecticut, where Lyme disease was first identified and, and described. Uh, and you can look at the, what's happened to Lyme disease uh, in the last uh, couple of decades. Here's the distribution of cases of Lyme disease by county uh, in 1996 on the left uh, and 2014 on the right. Uh, and not only has it gotten much more abundant, much more frequently occurring, but it has moved northward in both the upper Midwest, Wisconsin and Minnesota, and in the state of uh, states of Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont uh, you know, over that period of time. We're just beginning to see Lyme disease in Lubeck, Maine, where we live, uh, when it hasn't really been recorded there uh, uh, at all recently. Uh, so this is a case where the distribution of a, in this case, uh, an arachnid, a tick, uh, and the absence of very cold winters has allowed uh, its range to expand northward and therefore the range of the disease uh, that it carries. Now the case for malaria is even uh, more interesting. It'd be a little bit more alarming to you. Uh, this is the baseline, baseline uh, picture of where malaria occurs today from no risk and white uh, to high risk. <clears throat> no risk, risk uh, in white doesn't mean that a doctor will never see a malaria case enter the hospital. Uh, but almost always when those cases enter the hospital, it's been somebody that's traveled from an area of high risk. They're coming home from the Brazilian Amazon or something. Uh, and ending up in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, so malaria right now is 
a disease of warm, wet places uh, worldwide. Malaria late in this century is going to be much more prevalent. You'll see uh, even the Northeastern US, it says a doubling of the risk. Well, that may be a little bit of an exaggeration because the risk now is not very big, uh, but it means that something on the order of 450 million more cases will be found worldwide uh, late in this century of malaria as a result of uh, favorable warm, wet conditions uh, for the mosquitoes that carry it. And this is seen across the Eastern US. It's seen in the Mediterranean region. It's seen up here uh, in parts of China and Eastern Asia. <clears throat> Again, a widespread impact on the health of people late in this century as a result of the warming that's anticipated uh, with rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's also a few direct effects of carbon dioxide that I think are worth mentioning. Let me back up here a little bit. Everything I've talked about now is carbon dioxide raises the temperature, the temperature causes an effect, sea level rise, changes in forest, changes in crops, changes in disease. Now I wanna talk a little bit about a direct effects where rising carbon dioxide has an effect in, in and of its own on some part of nature or some part of our economy. The first one to notice here is, this is a graph of rising carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere uh, measured in the air in the red line here that shows some seasonal squeals uh, in dissolved in seawater in the blue line, which also shows some variation, but an upward trend. Uh, those are the changes in carbon dioxide concentration uh, over the last 20 or so years uh, measured globally. Well, as carbon dioxide rises in the atmosphere and therefore increasing amounts of it dissolve in ocean water, they make that water more acid. Carbon dioxide dissolving in water forms carbonic acid. This is why Coca-Cola and beer, both of which are industrially uh, produced by forcing carbon dioxide to dissolve in the liquid, are rather acid solutions. Uh, Coca-Cola has an acidity roughly around pH of two. Uh, it's down there with lemon juice. Well, what's been happening uh, in seawater globally as documented in a number of cases, is as carbon dioxide rises, increasing acidity seen as decreasing pH of seawater. From pH is that, well, when I was a graduate student, we used to talk about 8.3 is the normal. Uh, the historical record here doesn't go back that far, but it does go back to when it was slightly more than 8.1 and has now uh, dropped about uh, five hundredths of a unit below that. This is an increasing level of acidity in seawater. May not sound like a lot to you, but it is a lot to the various kinds of shellfish that have carbonate shells uh, that all of us enjoy. Some of us even depend on for livelihood or uh, parts of our diet. Uh, these are mussels off the coast of the state of Maine. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about mussels and oysters here a little bit. Uh, and here's uh, a graph that shows the pH of experimental seawaters in which mussels and uh, oysters have been raised compared to their ability to synthesize the carbonate that forms their shells, essentially uh, oyster shells and mussel shells. Uh, here at 8.1, that's kind of today's level of uh, the pH of seawater. But as carbon dioxide rises in the atmosphere, the pH will drop, it'll get more acid, and eventually these species will cross the threshold at about 7.5 where they can't synthesize carbonate shells at all. And this would be predicted with the loss of these species as a fishery, as a livelihood along uh, much of the coast uh, of uh, shallow waters in the Eastern US uh, and, uh, and globally. Uh, I would find that rel relatively alarming in terms of our changes in a phenomenon uh, of ocean chemistry. When I was growing up and we used to visit uh, the shores of Cape Cod as a family, my dad used to say the ocean was much too large to ever get polluted or show the effects of human beings. And I think we're now seeing that uh, the number of human beings and their impact on the planet has now exceeded the buffer capacity of the oceans. And in fact, they are changing. They're getting more acid, the mercury concentrations increasing, 
uh, and various other impacts are playing out uh, that we wouldn't have dreamed of uh, decades ago. I was involved a few years ago down here in North Carolina of an experiment to expose an entire forest to high levels of carbon dioxide and see what the effect of that, direct effect of that would have on forest growth. This is a, one of our experimental plots in the field that shows an area of forest is about 100 feet across, so it's the size of a good sized suburban lawn, um, surrounded by towers that emit carbon dioxide 24 hours a day year round and keep the level of carbon dioxide in that plot of forest uh, at an artificially high level that we set to anticipate the level of uh, concentration in Earth's atmosphere in the year 2050. Here's the delivery of the gas over here and there's pipes that ran it over to the plot. Uh, in this forest, we measured the diameter growth of the trees uh, with these uh, spring-loaded bands. Uh, and we looked uh, over the course of a number of years at the growth of trees, of vines, of shrubs at high carbon dioxide. So the blue line is today's level of carbon dioxide. The red bar here is the elevated uh, level of carbon dioxide. And in each uh, growth form, but particularly significant for trees and vines, the exposure to high levels of carbon dioxide uh, increased the growth rate considerably. <clears throat> so if you're a shareholder or wirehouser, you may say, well, that's great. We're getting something in the order of 5% more growth uh, at high carbon dioxide uh, every year and, and, uh, than we otherwise get. Uh, maybe a different story with vines. You see vines had a dramatic increase and the vine with the greatest increase turned out to be poison ivy. Uh, those of you that are uh, affected by poison ivy uh, can look to poison ivy as having something on the order of a 71% increase in growth as this century unfolds in the next 30 years. Uh, interestingly, I don't have the data to show you here today, but the level of the toxic compound, the allergen in poison ivy, uh, actually was higher in the uh, in this greater growth of poison ivy. Uh, so talk about a health hazard for those that are exposed to uh, poison ivy as a result of high CO2. Uh, you know, that'll be something that every one of us lives with. Those of you that suffer from uh, hay fever, uh, the distribution of pollen in this forest uh, also increased dramatically at high CO2. Now, a few years ago, a, a economic scientist from Stanford uh, looked at county, county, a county by county basis at the damage to the economy of coastal counties as a result of climate change, the anticipated climate change as the century unfolds. The greatest levels of damage were 20% uh, loss of gross domestic product uh, by the counties. Some of those were seen down here in Florida, largely because the whole county was flooded. Uh, but even up here in New England, Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, and down here in the Southeast, uh, something on the order of 10% loss of economic uh, productivity in coastal counties as a result of collectively some of the things I've talked about, changes in agricultural production, loss of land due to sea level rise, increasing levels of disease, increasing direct effects of high temperatures in the summer uh, on human uh, healthiness. Uh, so the economists among you, I mean, this is more than just an economic, uh, more than just an environmental story that ecologists worry about. Uh, this is something that uh, will play out with each and every one of us in terms of the economy uh, we live in. Now, I want to spend a few minutes on a kind of rather personal uh, level of looking uh, at uh, a solution to this kind of thing. I am a huge advocate of solar power. Uh, this is our house in coastal Maine, uh, which we power over here with a couple of solar panels uh, that uh, provide more than enough power every year. We're, we're a, actually a net supplier uh, to uh, the grid in the state of Maine. Uh, so we power, power our entire house uh, plus some. Uh, and, and this is in Maine where people uh, normally associated with, you know, cold, wet, windy conditions. I think with everything that I talked about here uh, today, I think how much better you could do in Arizona. But my point is that if it works in Maine, it ought to work in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New York State, where a lot of, I think, today's listeners uh, are living. 
Here are solar panels, 6.2 kilowatts uh, of installed capacity. Uh, now, the interesting thing about solar uh, photovoltaics, as we call them, is the cost has come down dramatically in the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, this is dollars per watt of installed. Used to be, of course, a hundred hundred dollars or so. It's dropped down to about uh, ten percent of that. Actually, dropped down to one percent of that uh, over the course of uh, the last several decades. This is the energy payback period in years. In other words, the time it takes uh, to pay back the energy it took industrially to produce the panels, because you know, I'd be crazy to tell you that solar panels were wonderful and, and produced a lot of power if it took enormous amounts of energy to produce them uh, in the factory where they're made. But we're now down to where within a year or so, you can replace uh, in power production the energy that it took to, to build the panel. The cost of uh, solar energy in terms of uh, dollars per uh, mega uh, watt hours. Uh, here, so here's solar. Uh, here, uh, these are various forms of energy that you may uh, be familiar with. Here's solar, here's wind, uh, here's natural gas, here's coal, here's nuclear. Uh, solar is right at the lower end of all of them. Wind can be a little cheaper depending on where you are, but solar is now directly competitive uh, with uh, coal. It's, it's much cheaper than putting up nuclear power plants uh, and is uh, you know, I think this is the energy of our future. The energy payback period, uh, as I said, the carbon payback period between 1.7 and 2.7 years. Uh, that's a really rapid uh, calculation. I estimate that our current savings on the panels in our house in Maine will produce a monetary payback period of about uh, seven to 10 years uh, in the course of operation. Now, of course, solar does have some problems, but none of these are uh, insurmountable. Uh, it's intermittent. The sun's not always shining. Sometimes it doesn't shine for several days in the state of Maine. But with net metering, where you run your meter one direction when you're producing and another direction when you're using, uh, a battery backup and interconnection with the local grid are really good solutions to this, uh, these various problems. For instance, this is diachromatically, but if you look at our house uh, in Maine, it's got panels. Ours are not on the roof, they're over in the, in the local field. Those panels give off, uh, whoops, those panels give off, hope I can back up. Maybe I can't back up. Previous, how about that? Ah, yes, those panels uh, produce direct current power, power, which is delivered to the house, and if there's enough of it, we can use that to charge a battery pack. If uh, we're using power in the various appliances and lights in the house, then rather than going to the battery pack, it goes to an inverter that converts the direct current to alternating current, which is the usual delivery of power to your house. And that either goes to the various, what are called loads, the refrigerator, washer, dryer, computers, lights in the house, or if there's enough being delivered and we have extra, it goes out to the local grid. Uh, so there's a number of fates of this power that can come off the top of the house. You can store it for future use. And then if the grid goes down, uh, this battery unloads through the inverter and supplies your loads, or you can deliver it to the grid and the meter is running forward and backward. We've had great luck with this so much so that I'm uh, going to be contracting to get batteries in there uh, this summer. I think the big issues with solar panels have not really played out yet because most of the ones that have been produced and installed have, are still in the, the useful part of their life. Uh, but the, the uh, panels and the batteries associated with them do contain a number of elements that are uh, something to pay attention to. Now, silicon is not one. Most of the Earth's crust has got a lot of silicon in it. Uh, but lithium, arsenic, cadmium, and tellurium, uh, some of these are uh, relatively rare in Earth, Earth's crust. Uh, and in the case of arsenic and cadmium, uh, have historically been known as acute poisons. And so we need to know and uh, pay attention uh, to what 
uh, happens to solar panels when they reach the end of their useful life. I hope that a large and active uh, recycling industry uh, comes to bear on the uh, solar photovoltaic uh, panels. And almost all of these uh, elements can be recaptured and put into new panels. Uh, but I want to tell you the, the good and the bad with these various kinds of things. Uh, when it comes to the bad, I'm most concerned about some of these toxic elements and how this will play out in the future. Uh, another thing to watch with solar is what we call energy sprawl. This is the area of the land that you need to generate a terawatt hour of power. Uh, and uh, of course, with uh, solar, you got to cover a, a, some area with solar panels. <clears throat> and so solar power here is right in the middle. It takes about very, just shy of 37 square kilometers of land area covered with panels to provide a terawatt hour of power. That's more than coal, and the coal includes the coal mines, even strip mines, and the area occupied by a coal-fired power plant. It's more than nuclear, but it's much less than the land that's required for wind energy, and hugely less than the land area that's required for energy crops. So anybody that tells you that bioenergy, bio crops are uh, the uh, solution to our future will grow corn and will uh, burn that and use it to produce power uh, has got to realize that that's going to take enormous amounts of land, uh, conversion of land to energy crops uh, and away from nature. So solar is not without an, uh, an energy sprawl imprint, footprint on the landscape, uh, but it's not huge. It's not as big as some of the others. Uh, a couple of closing remarks here. I uh, headed up the Cary Institute for uh, a number of years, had a great time doing that. It's in Millbrook, New York. Used to look like this. It's currently being renovated, so I have no idea what it's looked like uh, now. Uh, but these kinds of issues and the science that goes into climate change, acid rain, distribution of ticks and Lyme disease are the kinds of things that are tackled at the Cary Institute on a regular basis. I used to tell people it was a university with one department and no students. Uh, because it's basically a think tank, a scientific think tank, uh, for doing this kind of science quietly uh, with, with great impact on the future of the planet and the various kinds of environmental impacts that our burgeoning population will have on planet Earth. So what, that's what the Cary Institute is all about. I uh, urge you to visit sometime when the renovation's over. They have great uh, programs there. Uh, and I still publish under the Cary Institute banner uh, when I do scientific journals. Uh, the other thing is that you may ask what somebody like me does in retirement. Uh, and so this is a little bit of shameless self-promotion. Uh, I do a blog every week or 10 days or so uh, that deals with a number of these issues. I call it translational ecology because my aim is to translate what is often written as fairly complicated prose by scientists. It's written for other scientists on environmental issues. They're reporting the results of their work. Uh, they have to do it technically, but it's often very difficult for the general public to, first of all, find in a scientific journal, second of all, understand, and third of all, understand the policy implications of that. So I hope that my blog uh, on a regular basis can provide this translation. Uh, I spent years reading the science, doing the science, and now uh, my biggest concern is that when I talk about it either publicly like this, or in the blog, uh, that the people listening or reading uh, can understand why some of these things concern me and what we can do about it. The message is often not good about what's happening, uh, but there are uh, reassuring messages about what we can do if we have the desire to do so. So I'm gonna stop there. I think Lawrence wants me to be able to take a few questions, which I'll be glad to do. Enjoyed uh, seeing all of you log in here today and stay safe. Thank you very much. I think you definitely covered some of the New England related topics. We've got a whole range of questions here. I'll start with one of the longer two part. Um, <clears throat> there's some explanation as well. India has just announced plans to invest 55 billion in new coal powered projects between now and 2030. Africa has plans to build another approximately 2000 coal and natural gas power plants. New England has about one two thousandth the population of Africa plus India. 
how exactly is our restriction on our own CO2 use supposed to have any meaningful effect? Hockey stick graph is a splice of data from one source, mostly tree rings from 1000 to 1900, and thermometers 1880 to date. Is that appropriate scientific method? And the related second part to this is, weren't the tree ring records and hockey stick graph truncated after about 1950 because they declined even though thermometer temperatures increased? Didn't they truncate to quote unquote hide the decline? Please comment. Okay, those are really two questions. The first one is, uh, what should we do in New England uh, when there's burgeoning populations and uh, increasing economic development in India, China, Brazil, and other places around the world? These places, uh, India and China, I mean, the statistics that were quoted there pertain to coal, uh, but they're not ignoring solar and wind and uh, other ways of doing uh, things. China is actually ahead of us in terms of installed uh, solar capacity and the rate at which they're doing it. Um, do they need energy now beyond what they can get from some of the renewable sources? Sure they do, uh, but we need to be providing an example that this is important worldwide. Uh, we were responsible for most of the growth of carbon dioxide up to now. So I think it behooves us to be responsible uh, for doing as much as we can, which means replacing our emissions uh, as soon as we can uh, in the foreseeable future. We're all in this together. The sea level is going to rise globally. Uh, carbon dioxide mixes globally. There's not a little cloud of carbon dioxide that'll be over India and China. It will circulate globally. We need to help them transfer technologies and provide an example that moves this along on a global basis. This is why it was so awful that we dropped out of the Paris Climate Accord uh, as we did over the last four years. Uh, not that that was the all time solution uh, to climate change globally, uh, but it, made, it, it showed that uh, the US wasn't gonna provide real global leadership on this at a time when it was critical. Now the hockey stick graph, a really uh, different question. Uh, the hockey stick graph was immediately pounced on by the fossil fuel industry, oh, this can't possibly be right. First, I will point out that uh, it's been subjected to several National Academy reviews uh, that uh, have all uh, substantiated the general pattern there. In other words, fairly constant temperatures from 1000 AD up to about 1850, followed by a very sharply rising set of temperatures globally uh, in recent years. Uh, I think there's no question that the hockey stick graph, I and mean, we can argue about little ups and downs on it, uh, no question that the general shape of that graph uh, is absolutely robust and has stood the test of scientific scrutiny. And let me say there's nothing that a scientist loves particularly a young scientist that wants to get ahead in the world uh, more than to find that some old dogma by uh, established scientists is in fact wrong. Um, and uh, so this was subjected to uh, incredible scrutiny by people that stood to gain a lot by disproving it. Uh, and in fact, uh, it has stood that test of time. Now the question about putting uh, isotopic records, uh, tree rings, uh, and thermometers on the same graph. In fact, I mean, you can't reconstruct temperature back a thousand years uh, unless you use some of these indirect approaches with proxies and uh, isotopes and tree ring thickness. Let me say, for instance, that the oxygen isotope concentration in the cellulose of tree rings is laid down as a function of the temperature of the growing season in which that wood was grown. Uh, this is well documented in plant physiology and you can uh, use therefore the oxygen isotopic record in the cellulose uh, to uh, recalculate what the temperature that the plant grew in. And you can take a tree core, break that core up into year by year segments, analyze each of those for the oxygen concentration and get get a long-term record of the temperature. My point in the graph showing in blue reconstructed temperatures from tree rings and ice cores and coral reefs, and the fact that it overlapped almost perfectly with the red line, which showed the temperature as recorded 
in thermometers is actually meant as a full validation of the indirect way of reconstructing past temperatures. In other words, you look at the period where you have both ways of doing it and you find that they agree very closely. And that means that the reconstruction in the past has got a fair amount of validity to it uh, and is likely to be accurate. Um, so anyhow, those are my answers to those various questions. Comment on poison ivy. I am severely allergic and have noticed that it is getting worse. <laughs> the allergy or the existence of poison ivy? I think both in this case, both. interpreting here. Yeah. So uh, I don't know where that uh, viewer lives, uh, but wherever he or she lives, uh, I'd say you may be seeing uh, firsthand uh, we f what we found in the experiment down here in North Carolina, uh, that the plant not only grows faster and more, more robust uh, at high carbon dioxide levels, uh, but the allergenic compound in the leaves is uh, more concentrated. Uh, so brace yourself. On a related question, if the growth rate of poison ivy is a 71% increase, what is the growth rate increase of tree killing vine Asiatic bittersweet? And we could go further and say other invasive plants. Yeah, uh, so I can't fully answer that question except to say that uh, a number of species of vines have been examined. And it's not, our experiment was not unusual in showing a, the most dramatic response among the group of species that constitute vines. Uh, vines do exception, vines in general do exceptionally well at high carbon dioxide. It's not that trees don't respond, but vines do very well. We even speculated once that it's because vines put all of their new growth into new leaves. And of course, new leaves produce more photosynthate, uh, which produces a bigger plant. Trees have to put a lot of their photosynthate into, into wood. And wood doesn't produce more photosynthate. It's kind of a, it's a, draw, it's a draw out of the system. Uh, so vines kind of perpetuate their own success. Uh, I don't have experimental results on all those other species that were mentioned, but uh, I can say that uh, various species of honeysuckle <clears throat> and kudzu have been studied and found to grow uh, more luxuriantly as high CO2, and they're all vines. Can you comment on the recent UN report which stated that the world has failed to meet a single target to stem the destruction of wildlife and life-sustaining ecosystems in the last decade? The targets were negotiated in Japan in 2010. This failure, the report concluded, will undermine the goals of the Paris Agreement on the climate crisis and sustainable development goals. Okay, so that comment, uh, is what causes ecologists to get up in the morning and realize that their hairline has receded? Uh, when I was a dean down here at Duke and when I was president of Cary Institute, I used to say to people that asked me how and why I did my job that you get up every morning and you realize you may lose nine battles out of 10, but you're, you put on your tie and you go to work because you're gonna win that 10th one. Um, with the expanding human population now pushing 8 billion people globally, just the supply of habitat for us to live and the supply of food to feed us is taking an increasing toll on the area of land and the volume of the sea that's available for nature. And that indirectly makes it more difficult for us to do something about the climate crisis. There's been a lot of talk lately about using trees and uh, planting trees and encouraging the growth of existing trees uh, to take up carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that they will do. I've been a real proponent for uh, the need for more uh, tree, more forest habitat and preservation of more existing forest habitat. Uh, but as we cut that down, uh, it makes it more difficult to use that particular tool in the toolbox uh, as a, a solution to climate change. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's discouraging. Uh, but we really ought to be doing as much as we can to preserve nature, the natural biosphere upon which we all ultimately depend. 
this is more of a comment than a question, but I'm sure you have something to say. Uh, no mention of animal agriculture as a causal factor and its impact on global climate disruption. Uh, fine, I, I purposely left that out in the interest of time. Uh, anybody that enjoys a large beefsteak, I have to admit I do every now and again, it comes from a cow. Cows generate methane as part of their digestion. About 20% of the methane uh, entering Earth's atmosphere every year uh, it comes from cows. And uh, of course, cows are a human-induced uh, uh, impact on uh, the environment. And methane is a huge uh, contributor to greenhouse warming of the planet. Molecule for molecule, it's about 25 times more uh, effective than carbon dioxide at raising Earth's temperature. It's difficult to deal with methane other than to tell people to eat less meat and uh, therefore we need fewer cows. Uh, it's easier to talk about converting from fossil fuels to something uh, renewable that doesn't emit carbon dioxide. Uh, but animals have a huge role to play uh, particularly animals that emit methane. Indirectly, animals that we feed corn to, uh, we fertilize corn with uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Nitrogen fertilizer, when you put it on the soil, gives off nitrous oxide gas. Nitrous oxide gas is another greenhouse gas in Earth's atmosphere. It has 300 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So every time you're looking at an animal that eats corn, pigs, chickens, cows, and that corn has been grown with fertilized agriculture, indirectly, sometimes at great distance, uh, nitrous oxide has been added to the atmosphere and contributes to global warming. A few questions uh, related to uh, actually solar power. So I'll read them all off. And uh, how much power do your solar cells provide at night? Do you use lights and heat at night? Where does that energy come from? Are your cost comparisons taking any account of the cost of backup from fossil fuels or batteries at night? How long can the battery cover for you for? How about a week of overcast and snowy in the middle of winter? Well, I know the answer to that is to go to North Carolina. But <laughs> well, okay, there's a lot of questions rolled into one. Let me. Yeah. Uh, let me ramble a little bit on the answer to that. So no, they don't, our solar panels don't generate power at night. They don't generate power on a cloudy day in January when they may actually be covered with snow. And this is why we've retained our connection to the grid. So we generate during the summer twice as much power to be quantitative about this as we need to, to uh, on a yearly basis, annual basis, we generate twice as much power as we need uh, to run the house. That means that during a, during a nighttime in the summer, I have no qualms about uh, the fact that we're drawing from the grid uh, to supply the power we generated during the day. We're using the grid essentially as a backup. I'm assuming that our costs, uh, the cost comparison I gave you includes the cost that the local power company incurs by uh, generating power in a fossil fuel uh, power plant. Most of it in Maine is hydropower, but dams cost something too. I'm assuming that that's uh, uh, reflected in the bill that they uh, would otherwise send me uh, for the power that we use. Um, so that's how that gets included. Um, and the fact that uh, we send more power to them than we take means we don't get paid for that power. We're sending it gratis to the power company. Um, that covers their cost for that. Let's see, there was one final question there. Oh, the battery. Uh, so the battery system that would be installed with our solar system, uh, typically, uh, will provide, uh, based on our usage, about a day's worth of no power at all. Depends about if we're careful and run around and shut off the, uh, some things. Uh, but it can get you through times when the grid is down. And I want to, uh, truth and energy, we're getting that battery put in this summer. 
Well, I think you've answered most of, well, you've answered all the questions I've, I've put forth to you. I think we've got a combination of questions and arguments and comments and so forth. Um, but I think we've covered most of it. And I uh, really thank you for your wonderful presentation. I'm sure it's been enlightening for everyone. And there's a number of thank yous on the site and so on the comment box and so forth. So unless there's someone else who has some really burning question, I, I think we'll bring this to a close. And okay, well, thank you for having me and for all of you for being there. As I said, uh, you know, getting the word out to people that care and want to hear it uh, and arguing the ups and downs of some of these things, that's the name of the game. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Schlesinger. And uh, I'll see you all soon. Okay. Hey. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.